Okay, welcome students. Can you turn up the volume a little bit? I think this is getting weak. Uh, welcome and let's get ready with the uh, lecture. We're going to be talking about free fall today, but before we do that, um, I want to just review a couple updates uh, with you concerning grades. Uh, I, I uploaded um, yesterday the bonus point from Thursday's lecture. Did you synchronize the noon lecture? Okay, good. Uh, we'll do it again uh, for early registration. We synchronized the, the roster right before this class. And so uh, if you registered between Thursday uh, and today, you'll get a bonus point for today. Uh, here's where they are right now. There's three points up. And hopefully you've got at least one of those. Uh, but if you want to get some more point, uh, at least one more bonus point, uh, get your iClicker 2 registered. And I had a student ask me this morning in messages, Dr. B, can we use the Reef uh, Clicker system? And the answer to that is no. And the re there's a bunch of reasons for that. But um, basically what we're trying to do is keep things as simple as we can. And I've, I found that using those uh, cloud apps can be uh, kind of a complication. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not impressed with the technology yet to the point where I want to use it for my other classes. Anyways, here's the, up here you can see the, uh, the, uh, the three points that are on the books right now. Uh, down here is homework. Two, there's going to be homework three uh, activated for you uh, at 1.20 p.m. today. So that's right after class. And it will be due uh, on Thursday at 12.01 p.m., so right at the beginning of class. And that is the normal procedure for all homeworks. You'll normally get four attempts. So you can crush. If you don't crush the first attempt, you can crush uh, attempt number four or sooner. Uh, you'll, they'll usually be 45 minutes. Every once in a while, I'll give you an hour if, if there's a lot of calculations. And sometimes I'll give you five attempts if I feel like I want you to, to really, really practice hard on something. But usually it's 45 minutes per homework, four attempts, and uh, do at the next lecture, wh whichever it happens to be. So... Uh, Homework two is due this today at 12.01 p.m. And hopefully you did it. And uh, the grade is right down there. And another thing I want to mention to you is this gray rectangle down at the very bottom of your grades page in the past has caused a lot of confusion among the students in my classes because um, the percentages and the point values down there had absolutely nothing to do with our grading scheme, but they couldn't be turned off. But now this semester, it appears that I can turn them off. So this gray rectangle, I used to have to tell everybody, pay no attention to any of the numbers there. I mean, like I, I, a couple semesters ago, it was so bad that one of the categories, you know, like homework or something, uh, one of the students said, Dr. B, I have 14,000%. On homework, how can that be? And the answer is, it it's Canvas. Canvas is frequently it's my it's Canvas's way or the highway. And but and it used to be that way with this gray rectangle down at the very bottom. But thank God you can turn it off now. I hope it stays turned off, and I hope it does not confuse you. What you want to do is keep a running tally of how many homework points that you have. So like this homework two, uh, this test student account, 12 points. Uh, and, ho and the other thing is homework zero doesn't um, account for you, doesn't count with your homework. Homework one is your first official homework. Then homework two, tonight you're going to have homework three. Thursday you're going to have homework four over the weekend, due next Tuesday. 
etc., etc. All right, so uh, we've got a bunch of stuff to, to take care of. Questions about any of that? Let's keep going. Uh, we're going to talk about free fall. I want to review a little bit from last time. Uh, we talked about that movie, Hidden Figures, which I'm going to try to go see tonight. Uh, and uh, raise your hand if you've seen it. Okay, so that's more than last week. I'm going to go try to see it tonight. Uh, I might assign it as homework. Can I do that? I don't know. Uh, anyways, it's, I'm expecting it to be pretty cool. Um, anyway, uh, we talked about how um, if you have a, a constant acceleration system, you start from rest, for instance, use a distance triangle. If you have a constant velocity system, uh, same speed all the way through the, the motion, uh, use a distance rectangle. And that if you have something like a spacecraft with a changing acceleration, uh, not a straight line segment velocity graph, you break it down into a bunch of little trapezoids like this. All right, for an accelerating object, even if it's changing its acceleration, as spacecraft do, and that's what those um, people do down at NASA. So this particular diagram here uh, which shows a constant velocity, or excuse me, a constant acceleration for the V of T graph, the red line segment, uh, between initial velocity V subscript I and final velocity V sub subscript F, um, denoted by time T subscript I, the initial time, T subscript F, the initial, or the final time. Uh, the idea is that uh, the area under the graph, under the red line segment, we interpret as the distance traveled during this time interval. And so now this is not a position, it's just additional distance. So if the initial position was 22, you would compute the area of this trapezoid. Here it is, shaded in with green. Uh, you figure out the area of that and get a number of meters, you know, whatever it happens to be, and then add that to your initial position, 22 plus whatever the green trapezoid tells you. And what we talked about last time was how um, our technology, the distance rectangle and the distance triangle, you can use that for this figure uh, simply by breaking the trapezoid apart uh, into... Uh, two different shapes. So here's a, a, a dotted line here, a dashed line, uh, horizontally from V subscript I, right across to the other timeline. And when you do that, you get a right triangle, here it is, and you get a distance rectangle down here. All right, and once you've broken that apart or analyzed it into a distance triangle, and a distance rectangle, then uh, yeah, then you compute each of the sub areas, all right? And th that's basically what computers do. You know, they got you know half the PhDs on the planet and half the supercomputers on the planet down there at Mission Control in Houston, computing all these space spacecraft trajectories. And one of the things that they're you know, it sounds kind of you know rocket science and stuff, but you know, and everybody thinks, oh, man, that guy's a rocket scientist. You know, he's really smart. But all they're doing is adding up these little old triangles and rectangles. Here's the formulas. Uh, the distance triangle is basically this, one-half AT squared or some version of it. And we're going to use a different version today when we talk about free fall. And then the rectangle down here, the, the version that we used last a week, uh, is d equals vt, but I want to change the notation just a little bit because we're going to start talking about 
using this technology not just to compute a delta x, but to compute a position. So not just a change of position, but where actually are you? Because that's what you want to be able to do. You know, and all those guys in hidden figures, all those uh, ladies calculating all those numbers at the wazoo, that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to see, you know, where's the spacecraft going to be at some moment in time? Well, all right, they got to do a, a bunch of distance polygons. Now, the one that we're going to change here, here it is, D equals VT, that's nice, but I want to refine it just a little bit. I want to... I want to use this version of it. That distance rectangle is actually the height, the height of it is just VI, V subscript I, the initial velocity. And so this one, uh, this is the version we're going to, and, and actually we're going to go one step uh, further with this uh, today and uh, make it even fancier. But yeah, this is, this is the, the idea of the trapezoid uh, in general, uh, your initial velocity times time plus your uh, one half at squared for whatever the acceleration is. Oh, and by the way, remember rise over run is the acceleration. Rise over run in the velocity graph, the slanted part anyways, is the acceleration, and that's a number, you know, 2.4 meters per second per second, whatever it happens to be. And that's what goes in for the letter A there, right? Now, we're going to be applying this to the concept of free fall. And we're also going to be leveraging Galileo's uh, understanding of free fall and accelerations in general to get our toes wet or to get a toehold in Sir Isaac Newton's Three Laws of Motion. So we're going to be working in Chapter 2 today. Uh, if you haven't read it, make sure that's part of your homework assignment, uh, your homework uh, for tonight as well. Get, get that read. Uh, because our, our, chapter, our, this, our lecture today is going to be talking about Chapter 2 and a little bit of Chapter 3. We're going to dip into Chapter 3 just a little bit. And here's the interesting thing. Look, look at these guys in the army. Oh, man, can you... Jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. I, raise your hand if, if you've ever parachuted. One. Oh, we've got a bunch of... What is this? It's, and it's girls. It's all females. Look at this. Raise your hands high. Sweet. No guys in here. I've got the guts. What about you guys over there? No? No jump experience? But you're going to do it eventually, right? Yeah. I tell you what, I'd be kind of nervous about it too. <laughs> Look at those guys. Oh, my God. Ah. Anyways, free fall. Now, Galileo made this decision in his study of the grand book that we call the universe. He said, I'm going to focus on free fall because I've done measurements of free fall. And I found that it's, it's pretty simple as an acceleration. It's not like acceleration of a, a ship in the ocean, you know, which is, you know, getting faster and faster, but it is also turning in different directions. It's always straight down. And uh, it's fairly simple to describe. And we're going to describe that right now. He said, you know, I observe a stone initially falling at rest um, up there at the top of the tower, leading tower of Pisa. Uh oh It just flickered. You know, I, I just nudged the, the uh, we're using the uh, HDMI cable here. And it's a lot better, but it's still, if you touch it, it, it flickers. Sorry about that, you guys. Anyway, so here's the leading tower of Pisa. Um, and so he wrote, this is a quote from Galileo. I observe a stone initially at rest up there at the top of the top floor, falling from an ele elevated position on the leaning tower of Pisa, continually acquiring new increments of speed. Isn't that what acceleration is? You're getting faster and faster. I mean, in free fall, if you're on the way down, yeah, you're getting faster and faster, right? 
So here's another uh, sentence that he wrote. He said that if we examine the matter carefully, we find no addition or increment more simple than that which repeats itself always in the same manner. Now that's what now he knew that to be the case from free fall. And he did experiments, you know, like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And he did experiments with ramps and stuff in his lab, you know, in his laboratory. And let's make a table of free fall time and free fall speed. And we're going to kind of as it, as if he could measure free fall in the metric system that's what we're going to talk about here okay so let's let's start with his time measurements i'll drop it from rest v equals 0 and start my stopwatch so t equals 0 so the first line of this table and make sure you have some room for another three or four lines in this table um, at time t equals zero, I start my... So that's him starting his stopwatch, okay? And then the, the phrase from rest, that means 0, 0.0 meters per second in the table. So talking to his friend at the cafeteria, he would use the phrase at rest. But Bobby, if he was trying to write down a table, um, he would write down 0, 0.0 meters per second. That means the same as the verbs at rest or the, the words at rest. So uh, now the whole idea of repeating itself always in the same manner after one second of free fall, you know, if he had his radar gun or however he measured it, he would have found that it had acquired 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. Right now he didn't have the metric system. But we now think that um, he actually did do this ex famous experiment, you know, with the cannonball and the musket ball and drop them at the same time and everything. And uh, I know when I was in high school, there, you know, the, the, the theory was, oh, no, he really didn't ever do that. It's just a myth. But now some of the, the Galileo scholars say, yeah, he, he probably did. Anyways, the whole idea of repeating itself in the same manner means the following. In the next second, he gets another 9.8, total of 19.6. All right? And his, his theory is, and what his measurement and observation showed him was, that no matter what your time in increments are, if you take equal increments of time, you get equal increments of speed, and it's downward. And in the metric system, if your time increment is one second, then you're going to get 9.8 meters per second of speed. And it's going to be downward. So after three seconds, 29.4. In other words, three times 9.8. Check it out on your cal. By the way, you guys are going to need your calculator in just a few minutes and your clicker. We're going to do a calculation Uh, concerning drop distance and all these concepts. Four seconds of drop time. 39.2. Oh, boy. Headache. Etc. So as, as, as much, you know, until it hits the ground, this is the behavior. So you can put etc. or ditto marks if you want. And so the pattern is... And let me just um, say it verbally. For every second of free fall, you acquire, always in the same manner, 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. So add the word downward somewhere in your table to indicate these numbers signify downward velocity. All right? And here's your... Here's how, you know, you would, you know, he's, he's saying this always repeats itself, always another 9.8 meters per second of downward speed for every second. All right. Now, if you're, if you're from another planet and you don't use the seconds system, you know, if you use, you know, some alien time unit, 
You know, the second is based on the size of the Earth and how fast the Earth spins, that's all. So if you're on a different planet, the equivalent time would be a little bit different. But it, their table would look very similar on their planet, whatever planet, you know, whatever your home planet happens to be. Now, here's how you express it in, not in a table, but in an equation, a simple equation. The, the normal symbol that we use, especially for the acceleration due to gravity, is G, lowercase g. And um, we write it this way, 9.8 meters per second per second. Uh, another way to write that a little more compactly is 9.8 meters per second squared. And it means for every second of free fall, you acquire 9.8 meters per second of downward speed if you're on the way down. Now, you can make a side note that if you're on the way up, you know, if you pop up a baseball straight up, you know, straight back down to the catcher so you're out. I mean, on the way up, you're losing 9.8 meters per second of upward speed. So add that to your notes here. That's the other half of the coin. On the way down, yeah, you're gaining 9.8 meters per second downward for every second you're on the way down. But if you're on the way up, if, you're go, if you go up for a second, you lose 9.8 meters per second of anything that you had that was going upwards. So the initial velocity, V-I-Y, the initial Y component of the velocity is going to be important for us, all right? Whether it's positive or negative. Now, let's take a look at, and, and there's the definition of uh, acceleration there. But for, for this one, uh, G is the normal symbol. Uh, side note number two, this is the value of Earth's acceleration, Earth's gravitational acceleration, everywhere that you go on Earth. Now, there are small variations. If you're on top of Mount Everest, you're at a high altitude, or if you're up at 30,000 feet in an aircraft, you know, you're flying up to DC, and you're traveling at 35,000 feet, uh, gravity is going to be a little bit weaker up there simply because you're further away from the center of the Earth. And, uh, but it's, not, it's still going to be pretty close to 9.8. The bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of the ocean, the Pacific, um, if you're in a submarine anyways, and you drop something, 9.8 meters per second squared. Right? So from the bottom of the deep blue sea all the way to the top of Mount Everest, if you drop something, 9.8 meters per second, now, if they make devices called gravity meters or gravitometers, and airplanes have them to pick up very small variations, you know, like 9.8001 versus 9.8002, you know, it, and they have gra gravitometers that are that precise, and they use it for uh, prospecting for minerals. You know, so if they, if they fly over a mountain range and all of a sudden they get a lot of gravity, that means there's a lot of heavy matter below them, and that might mean gold in the mountains. And I, I'll never forget, when I was in high school, my earth science teacher, when I was in ninth grade, uh, Mr. Caprio, God, less, God love him. Uh, my first, and my first... Uh, love, scientifically speaking, was geology. And so I loved that class. And he, had, he was a guy that uh, was retired, and he had been a geologist uh, out west in uh, New Mexico, the Four Corners area of New Mexico, uh, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and, and up in Alaska. And he had all kinds of stories uh, about all the gold in Alaska. He said that in the Brooks Range, you can't get it out of the mountain because it's, it's such tough conditions. But he said there's tons of gold up in Alaska in the Brooks Range, which is the furthest north mountain range. It's a big mountain range, but completely hostile conditions because it's so far north. But he said if somebody could figure out a way to get it, there's a ton of gold up there. And he had stories about, and, you know, down in the Four Corners area, the southwest, and, you know, he told us all about the gra gravitometers. They would tow it behind an airplane, 
and they would use it to discover oil formations, petroleum. And he worked for uh, Exxon, I think, in that period. So it was really cool. Anyways, most places, um, a matter of fact, the very first place where they measured it uh, for precision was in Scotland, next to a great big mountain. And they figured that they knew the, the density of the rock and the mountain and the rough volume, so they knew how much, how, how much mass was there, how many kilograms of extra rock, and they were able to, to see the change in the gravitational field because of that. Um, third side note, G, the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of, of Earth, 9.8 meters per second per second. Now, gravity extends an infinite range out into space. It's an infinite range force. The space shuttle, the International Space Station. Now, they're up there. The acceleration of gravity up there, they've got a downward acceleration. So if you're up there in the space shuttle and you bailed out, man, would that be cool or what? Bailing out of the space shuttle of the International Space Station, if you could survive it. Man, that would be, you know, if you had the right kind of parachute, you know, like a fireproof parachute. Man, that would be cool. Anyways, eight, it's 8 point something up there, 8.3, 8.4, depending on how high up you are. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope's even further up. Uh, so those guys, they're not 9.8 up there, but surface of the Earth, yep, 9.8. Uh, all right, drop distance formula. We already know it, but let's put it together. All right, here's a velocity graph in red for an object that starts at rest right here at the origin of the two axes. All right, V equals zero there. And it's acquiring downward velocity, downward speed. Uh, so it's down here in the negatories. So after one second, negative 9.8 meters per second. After two seconds, right here, the, set, the third dot at time t equals two seconds, uh, negative 19.6 meters per second. All right? Now the distance that you have dropped for this time interval is the area of this rectangle. We already know how to do that. The vertical part is just delta V. That's not that hard. In this case, delta V is G delta T, right? The base, it's up here on the time axis, delta T. So one half base times height. Da 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 da. One half GT squared, right? So for a generic acceleration, uh, we, we use the, the notation 1 half at squared, you know, for some generic acceleration, horizontal or, or anything else. But if, if you're in free fall, we use the symbol g, but it's, it's the same as using the letter a. We just, you know, we use g a lot, so. Now, I want to do a calculation with you. So take out your, your calculator, take out your clicker, and what we're going to do is a calculation that you might remember from the movie Lord of the Rings where uh, Perig the brainiac known as Pippin Took, Peregrine Took, dropped that whatever down the well in the mines of Moria and caused a lot of trouble. A ma matter of fact, it's what caused Gandalf to be killed. Temporarily killed, anyways. So you drop a rock. So um, put your, uh, if, you, if you haven't used your eye clicker before, hold the power button down until it, the square blinks and then type in BB. And once you've done that, you'll get the message go nitro and then ready. And then figure this out. How deep is this well? You hear the splash at 3.2 seconds. So there's your drop time. Okay, and just take a second to, or a minute or so, and hey, you guys, when you do this, hit the, type in your number to something, point something, something, the nearest hundredth of a meter, nearest point oh one of a meter, and then hit the send key, because when you're doing numeric, 
the, the software doesn't know when you finished. So you have to tell it, when you finished, my answer is complete. Um, you know, 22.31, and then hit the send button. And that's like telling my computer, yep, that's their final answer. All right? So do that quickly. I'll give you a minute. I don't understand what that answer is, that top answer. Yeah, I don't understand what that is. Let's see, there it is down there. Oh, you know what it is? I think it's GT. Can you try that? Yeah. Uh, 3.2 times. Did you grade the first one? Yeah. Good. Lovely. Okay. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. All right. Now make sure you use the drop distance formula. Don't use uh, delta V equals G delta T. I mean, that's nice for delta V, but. We're trying to get the drop distance. <sighs> Man, I'm getting a headache. I wonder if the weather's changing. Raise your hand if you're using your clicker for the first time today. Okay, good. Is it working okay? And uh, hey, you guys, uh, it's a good idea if you can bring your calculator with you every day. Just have it handy. It'll speed things up for you in lecture. I mean, you can use your cell phone, but on exams, you can't use your cell phone. So you may as well start bringing your regular calculator so you get used to using it and stuff. Is uh, Twitter working yet? Yeah, it started working again. All right. Is that what you're doing now? No, I was doing that. Oh, good. I'm doing it now. Yeah, good, good. Uh, 30 seconds. It is like it is weird. I don't know why it's not working. Uh, it's no, I've heard of Twitter breaking down like that before, you know, for a couple of hours or whatnot. Facebook never does, but Twitter <laughs> is different technology. Yeah. Facebook is just a big, gigantic database. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All right. Yeah. All right, the correct answer is 50.18. We'll go over it in just a minute. Uh, I want you to look at the second one there, 31.36. You might have heard me quizzing Caroline, what is that number? And you guys, if you voted for 31.36, that's G delta T, and that is incorrect. Uh, now, can you go down and find a... Five point This thing is uh can't you use your fingertip on that, I thought. Don't use your use your fingertip. There we go. Hundred point three. Oh, look at 100.35. You know what that is? That's somebody that forgot to multiply by one half. Right? Because the real answer is 50.18, and that's double it. Uh, keep going down. Now, look, 5.12. All right? 
that's somebody that misplaced the decimal point. All right. Now, the reason I'm going over this particular set of errors with you is when I grade your exams and look at your clicker calculations, I'll be able to see, all right, they missed a factor of one half. I'll give them partial credit. So if it's a three-point question, I might give you two points, even if it's not correct, if it's, if it's an easily, easily identifiable error. Okay? Now, you can't do that on Scantrons, but you can do it with clickers. And for the student that was asking me why we don't use Reef, that is why. Right. One of the reasons, anyways. All right, so let's review that calculation. Can you go to the laptop now? Thank you. Let's review it. All right, Peregrine took. Here we go. There's your drop distance formula. And just put the numbers in. Here's your plug-in step. You know, one half, that's 0 0.5. And then good old 9.8 meters per second squared. And then in square brackets, 3.2 quantity squared. Now make sure you have that written carefully because that can trip you up too. All right. The next step, now what I normally do is I try to simplify things. So this one's easy. 0 0.5 times 9.8. You can do that in your coconut. 4.9. So that's you know, that's my next step over here in the parentheses. Now, in the square bracket over here to the right, I've got 3.2 seconds quantity squared. Now, notice that inside the brackets, I've got 3.2 squared. You know, so you do that on your calculator. That's what it works out to. All right. And then I have seconds squared inside the brackets. All right. So when you have... 3.2 seconds, quantity squared, you square the number, and you square the unit. Right? So your, your answer there is 10.24 seconds squared inside the brackets. All right, you're almost done. Now you just multiply those two numbers together, and you get 50.176. Round it off to the nearest uh, 0.01 meters. Ching! 50.18. And that's a pretty deep well. All right. Now, just to remind you, when we do calculations in class, uh, frequent and especially on this one because there's a lot of errors, uh, we'll frequently go over it after the question, and sometimes we'll do it again. We'll try a different version of it. You know, so I might say, "All right, a different mine, uh, the mine of Slobo Slobovia, and the drop time is 2.7 seconds." Do it again. And see if you guys can do it again, all right? And uh, so we'll, the, what, I, what I want to emphasize is we'll try to go through the calculations step by step because not everybody is in here has had calculus. Some of you have, some of you haven't. You know, I've got to teach all of you. So, that's, so those of you that have had calculus, be patient. Question? If... The question was, will the meters per second squared always be 9.8? Yes, the accelerate, as long as we're on this planet. Now, if I ask you a question about the moon, and I'll state it, you're on the moon, you know, you drop, you know, you're an Apollo astronaut, you drop something. On the moon, for instance, G is much smaller, it's 1.6, okay? On the surface of Mars, uh, it's much smaller. Mars has weaker gravity. It's stronger than the moon, but weaker than Earth. Venus, similar, all right? So, but I'll always tell you, you know, what planet you're on, okay? I might even make up a, a fictional alien planet, you know, planet X or something like that. Now, last thing I want to comment to you on uh, is in regard to the constant G, gravitational acceleration at the surface of Earth, if you're using it in a drop distance formula, you're just figuring out a little distance. Uh, don't need to use the minus sign. But if you're trying to figure out a position and the coordinate, you know, the y coordinate up and down, then you, you want to use a minus sign. And we're going to put that together uh, next. Okay? So um, I'll show you where we would put the negative 9.8 and k. 
calculate with it. And we'll probably do some negative 9.8 calculations uh, for the next couple weeks. So we, we'll get used to it. By the way, uh, February 7th is our first midterm exam. So uh, you'll have to know how to use G, a regular 9.8 or a negative 9.8 by that time for sure. That's two, two, that's two weeks from today. So, uh, All right, we're now ready to put together Galileo's formula for the y-coordinate that I mentioned in lecture two. And let's get to it. What we now can handle, you know, the, in lecture two, I used this slide, you know, the diagram of a, a baseball, the parabola, or half the parabola, parabolic arc of a baseball on the way up. And I said, you know, we want to be able to predict where and when it's going to be um, at some particular time or some particular distance, how, how long is it going to take? And we're going to put together the vertical part of it now. We can handle this uh, distance here. The change in position between uh, final position Y subscript F and the initial position down here Y subscript I. Now we, we actually know how to do the horizontal position as well and we're going to talk about that today. All right. Now uh, that being the case, let's get the formula going. How do you figure out the formula for the final value of the y coordinate, y subscript f? Here we go. First, you start with the initial position. Now, if something's at rest, this is your, the end of your calculation. But if something's in motion, you've at least got a distance rectangle. And if it's in free fall, you have to have a distance triangle with a g. All right? Now, there's your their first um, amendment to the formula. V I Y subscript I Y stands for the Y component of the initial velocity. So down here, it's it, it's heading upward, so it's got to have a little bit of miles per hour, a little bit of meters per second down there, and that's what this quantity is. All right. Now, if there were no gravity, it would just keep going at that rate and, it, and you'd be done. But you do have gravity, so you have to have a distance triangle. And there it is. And this is where the minus sign comes in. This will handle um, with a, a negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Where, where you, you know, when you actually plug in your numbers in this formula, you have to. This will handle the y-coordinate of any baseball that's hit in the baseball field of play. All right? It'll, it, you know, we, we usually think of a, a baseball as, ha as being, you know, a little bit of upward motion, you know, so that it clears the outfield or clears the infield. Okay? So if, if your baseball has an upward motion to start, then you've got a positive VIY, all right? G is negative 9.8, et cetera, et cetera. So if you, if you know that, then you can figure out your, you can predict the position at any time. If you're up on top of the Libra parking garage, that's a pretty tall structure, all right? And actually, I've never parked up on top. Anybody up here ever parked on top of that? Yeah, it's it's up there. You know, can how how tall is the wall around the? Is it like, is it like this? I, I mean, is it up to your neck or something, or is it? So you could look over it. Okay, and you could drop something on. You know, like if you see your enemy down below, you could you know like a water balloon or something. Okay, so if you're up on top. Now we're kind of joking around about water balloons and stuff, but if if you're if you are up there and you throw something downward, well then VIY is going to be negatory. All right? And then you're going to be getting extra speed because G is negatory as well. So this formula handles either case. A baseball heading upward to start 
or, you know, or a water balloon heading downward to start. We can handle both. You know, or any, you know, anything, you know, that's, that's launched, you know, with any uh, Y component for the velocity. All right. Now, this is the, the half of the formula by, and, and read the rest of chapter two to get the, the rest of the story. Um, the other formula is the X coordinate, X subscript F equals XI plus VI X times T. That's it. Because the X motion has no acceleration. Gravity is only downward. There's no such thing as horizontal gravity. So the easy part of the trajectory of a baseball, cannonball, water balloon, whatever you got, as long as it's in free fall, uh, the easy part is the, is the horizontal part. That's just a distance triangle, or excuse me, distance rectangle. Now, if you have a Ferrari driving off a cliff, uh, you've got some horizontal motion. So if he's going 50 miles an hour at the top of the cliff, and then he goes off the cliff. Side note number one, and this is before we even get into number one here in the regular part of the notes. But side note number one, preliminary side note, the horizontal speed of the Ferrari stays 50 miles an hour until he hits the ground. What changes for the Ferrari is his downward speed. So his Y subscript F is basically going to be YI plus one half GT squared. Because he start if he drives straight off the cliff, he doesn't have any 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 vertical velocity. He's got all horizontal, but he gradually acquires vertical, and uh, and he follows his path. This is a parabolic arc. All right. Now, now Galileo was the one that said, "Look, you, you can do this." And the reason that you can do this is because it's possible to have a state of motion where there's no forces. And you have constant velocity. Now, Aristotle would not have accepted that. And that's what we're going to talk about now in the context of a Ferrari driving off a cliff. All right. So Aristotle's view was the following. Every motion requires a mover. And so every motion, if something's in motion, there's got to be a force on it. Now, he was extremely complicated. For instance, his description of an arrow in flight is really hard to follow. You know, like the air comes around from the front and is pushed to the back, and then it pushes the arrow forward from and back, and it just keeps going. It's... But Galileo figured it out a little differently and accurately, and it measured up. Here's what Galileo said. He said, yeah, there are forced motions, you know, you know, gravity being one of them, force of gravity. But he said there are unforced motions which do not accelerate, all right, and do not have a force. They neither slow down uh, nor speed up. And Galileo, um, and we're at about page 29 or so in the textbook, uh, Galileo is the one that, that was able to come up with this. For Aristotle, there were two states of motion. You were either at rest or you were being pushed or pulled by something, a forced motion. No matter what your velocity, if you were moving, you were being pushed or pulled. And Galileo said, if you're moving and you're constant velocity, that means you don't, you don't necessarily have any forces. That is allowed. You don't have to have forces acting. All right, now we're going to go through Galileo's logic for that. All right, here we go. So first you think of a hypothetically frictionless horizontal plane, you know, up off the surface of the earth. Okay, and you get your Ferrari. And up on that horizontal surface, the, what Galileo said, based on his, his experiments with ramps and stuff, he said, look, if it's horizontal and frictionless, it's going to keep going. It's, it's indifferent. It doesn't care whether it's at rest or at a constant velocity. If it's at 50 miles an hour up there on that hypothetical frictionless surface, it'll stay 50 miles an hour. 
and it'll stay in the same direction. It won't change. And he said, if it's at rest, yeah, you know, it'll stay at rest. But if it's in motion, 50 miles an hour, constant speed, bing, no problem for Galileo. All right? He said, if, if it's in motion, it'll persist at that constant velocity until it drives off the edge of the plane. So that's like a Ferrari driving off a cliff. Now, a cliff is not frictionless, but this is, you know, like a frictionless horizontal surface, and you could, that off the edge of which you can drive a Ferrari. Okay? And so what happens next is where Galileo used his idea of indifference to being at rest or in motion at constant velocity. And what we're now going to go through is Galileo's proof how he defeated Aristotle and developed the true formula for the trajectory, the gravitational trajectory of a cannonball or any other ballistic object. Anything that's been fired out of a cannon or jumped out of a plane or shot out of a pea shooter or anything else. Okay? Any spit wad, as soon as it leaves your fingertip, you know, it's in a ballistic trajectory. So, the beginning of his proof is this. You know, he's talking to Aristotle and he says, okay, Aristotle, well, let's talk about this. Um, let's talk about an object on a hypothetically frictionless plane and it is moving at constant speed. And so Aristotle says, well, that's nice, but it has to have a certain amount of push force. You know, because Aristotle said, you can't have any motion unless there's a push or a pull. Okay, so Aristotle said, all right, fine. Horizontal, frictionless, nice, good, perfect, nice, wonderful, but you gotta have a push. All right, so Aristotle says, matter of fact, if it's this car, it's going to have 0.02 metric units of force. All right? So this is hypothetical now. So, so Aristotle says it's not very big force. It might even be 0.02 units of force. All right? Pretty small. He says it's got to have something. All right? So, th so this, is the, this is like the hypothetical. It's like a thought experiment, you know. Galileo's up there on this horizontal plane with, you know, and they've got chairs. They're sitting there and they're not moving. Uh, but they're watching this thing go by and Galileo says, yeah, no force is acting on it. Perfect. 50 miles an hour, no force is acting on this car. And then uh, Aristotle says, no, nope, it's got to have at least 0.02 to keep going at that speed. That was his philosophy. All right. So V is constant. And the push force, uh, letter P here, is uh, to the right, and I've made my arrow fairly small. Now, hopefully you can do the rest of this, because now we're going to go through what Galileo said. He said, look, I know my ramps, and I know all about how stuff gets pushed by gravity down a ramp. You know, steep ramp, you know, at a tilt angle of 80 degrees, or a shallow ramp at a tilt angle of 10 degrees. I know my ramps. I know my straight down free fall, a tilt angle of 90 degrees. And he said, look, you, you've got this. Yeah, okay. Your car, yeah, okay, push force P. And it's got a weight force. So go ahead and draw an arrow. And I want you to make this arrow five times bigger, if you can. Or kind of eyeball it in, five times bigger than your push force arrow, the horizontal one. Now Galileo says, yeah, okay, good. Push force, 0.02, good, nice, wonderful. Let's check the, the, the mass of this thing. And, and, excuse me, the weight of this thing. And it happens to be uh, 0 0.100 metric units of force, right? So let's say that that's what we got. Now Galileo said, this thing if it was going straight, if it was in free fall, I'd have to hold it up with 0 0.100 metric units of force for, for it to not fall. 
No, wait for us. If it, if it was off the plane, it would you know fall and it have a force and I have to exert that much force upward. All right. If it's on a ramp, you know I don't have to exert as much force. It'd be proportionally smaller. And we're going to work out how small it is in just a second. And uh, Galileo said, yeah. You know, any any time you're on a ramp, you have to push something. You have to exert a little bit of force to keep things stable on the ramp. Or if it's in free fall, you got to exert a, quite a bit of force to keep it stable from falling. All right. So Galileo's saying, yeah, all right, wait for us. I, let me copy all these vectors, Professor Aristotle. So here here are the copies. Now look, see them. Now I'm going to move them. Okay. I'm going to move the push force arrow over here, all right, and I'm going to dip it vertically. And then I'm going to move the weight force arrow. And then what I'm going to do is turn it this way so that it forms a ramp. All right, now, go ahead and sketch in a ramp. And the height of the ramp is whatever Aristotle said. 0.02 or anything else. The length of the ramp, the slant part, the hypotenuse of the ramp is whatever the weight of, of the car is. And Gallo says, yeah, I can measure that no matter what. So whatever you say, Aristotle, I'm going to build this ramp. And because I know ramps, um, for instance, this one has a, hypot a height to hypotenuse ratio of 1 to 5. I know also that the amount of force pushing anything down the, you know, this ramp, it's got a, it's got a, uh, a rise over a run. It's going to, so things are going to be pushed. You know, gravity's going to pull, pull stuff down the ramp. You can balance it. And Galilee says, I know how to figure out exactly how big the force is that you have to balance it with. How much gravity's pulling it downward with. I know how to do that. And here's what he says. You take the arrows. You build a ramp of exactly the same proportion as these two arrows. So this example, one to five. And then you say, all right, now rotate the arrows so that the, the Aristotle part, little p, is parallel to the ramp. And here's the arrow for the weight force. Now look at this. This is going straight downward. This is now the weight force. And this little teeny arrow is now the downward force that pushes stuff or pulls stuff down the ramp. And so Galileo says, yeah, okay, 0.02 for a flat plane, according to you, Aristotle. But no, that's not right. 0.02 newtons is what this car would need if it was on this ramp. This is the force accelerating it down this ramp. So whatever the horizontal plane is, you are overestimating Aristotle. It needs less than what you say. And here's the kicker. Um, whatever the flat plane needs, it's definitely less than 0.02. This triangle and set of forces proves that. And, Arist and, and Galileo you know, fictionally, you know, putatively, said to Aristotle, no way, Jose. It can't be 0.02 for this car. And I don't care how small you make it. Um, 0.002 or 0.0002 or anything else. I can build a ramp. As soon as you say that, I know the dimensions of the ramp that I got to make. And, 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 and I can show that whatever the force is required on the horizontal plane, it's smaller than that. So no matter what you say, Aristotle, you are busted. I can always build a ramp to contradict you. And therefore, Galileo proved by demonstration that a state of motion exists between a forced motion and rest. The state of motion, we call it inertial motion, constant velocity, constant direction, constant speed, constant direction, All right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, 
So here's what Galileo said. If there's no forces acting on it, it's going to stay in that state of motion. You know, up there on that hypothetical surface, if it's got 50 miles an hour of speed to the northeast, it's going to keep going that way until it drives off the cliff. All right? So constant speed, constant direction. And this is the law that Galileo developed. And guess who used it? His number one student, Sir Isaac Newton. This became his first law of motion. Right? And so now we're in chapter 3. Chapter 2 is kind of small, short, but sweet. A lot of thinking. Well, let's talk about the laws of motion. First of all, and this is how Newton wrote it. Every object retains its state of rest or state of uniform straight line motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Now, as soon as you drive off that hypothetical surface, then you don't have an, all your forces balanced. Okay, the hypothetical surface supports you against gravity, but as soon as you're off the surface, then gravity is unbalanced and down you go. Now, here's another example of that. An apple and an apple tree, there's a pair of balanced forces. And when they fail, the, the uh, apple is no longer at a state of rest. Okay, first of all, the stem, which is attached to the branch and attached to the apple, right? it you know, pulls the apple upward. Okay, gravity pulls it downward. And as long as that stem is strong enough, you know, the apple's not too big. And as long as the stem doesn't dry out, you know, if it gets too dry, it'll be brittle and it'll fall. Um, that, that apple stays up in the apple tree. But we all know that Sir Isaac Newton, the apple conked him on the coconut and he discovered the law of gravity. As a result, they say, another legend, Nobody knows if that one's true. They think the one about Galileo and the Leaning Tower of Pisa is true, though. But as soon as that fails, you know, the stem weakens and the balance fails, and it's going to fall right onto Sir Isaac Newton's coconut. Now, this is, this is an example here of something that stays in a state of rest. All right? Now, Galileo said there's this other state, constant velocity, inertial state, and let's do an example of that. Let's use the example, and you, you'll see that you'll read my discussion of it slightly different in the textbook, Chapter 3, about the UCF shuttle bus. All right? You're on the shuttle bus, and you're standing out in the aisle. So I'm going to stand up. You know, and you know, like when you're riding a bike when you're a little kid, and you learn how to drive, you, you learn how to ride your bike with no hands, and you go around, whoa. You go around saying, look, Ma, no hands. Did you ever do that? My son did that, you know, he said, look, Pop, no hands. And it, like two seconds later, he fell on, fell on the sidewalk and, you know, he didn't get too hurt. But anyways, so you're in the, you're in the, you know, you're in the aisle. You're not holding on to anything, no hands. And the vehicle, the bus starts forward. What happens to you? You want to stay at rest. Your feet move because they're attached to the bus. And the bus moves at two miles an hour, and you're still at zero miles an hour, you fall backwards if the bus moves forward. All right? So you want to stay in that state of rest. All right, if you're, at, if you're traveling down the road, you know, and there's not too many bumps or anything, and it's going 20 miles an hour, and the bus driver, I sometimes think they're maniacs, uh, he decides to speed up to 30. Right, so you're out there in the aisle, look, mono hands, and we're going 20 miles an hour, and you're happy as a clam because there's no forces acting. Okay? And all of a sudden, he speeds up to 30. Back you go. Right? Same thing if you're standing up you know, 20 miles an hour, you know, and you're, you know, look, mono hands, and he slows down to 10. Face plant. You go right, you pitch forward. Okay? So... That's A here. If the bus moves um, forward, you lurch backwards, etc. All right? Now, the second diagram here, if the bus turns right, okay, so the bus is turning right, and you're, and, you know, you're driving down the road at 20 miles an hour, and he starts taking a turn to the right, you're going to, you're going to, your, the, your body, your, 
center of mass wants to keep going straight ahead at 20, not off to the right at 20. So as, as a result, you're going to go straight. The bus is going over there. So the, so the seats on the left of you bump into your left hip. All right? If you're standing up, no hands. So uh, same thing if you, if you turn to the left. You know, you want to keep going straight, and the bus turns left, you bump your right hip into the seat next to you. All right? So that's why when you're, you know, riding the bus, uh, you want to stabilize forward and aft, port and starboard. Unless your bus is, is out in space and never changes direction or speed. You know, if you're on a bus to another planet. Hey, that would be a cool movie. The bus to another planet. All right, now, here's another picture. Look at this one. This is about new, uh, Galileo's separation of the motions. Now, make sure you subscribe to my highlighters because I added some highlighters this morning, some new ones. Uh, look at the blue arrows for the football. You know, you think about it, when the football, when the quarterback throws the football, you know, good old number seven, he's, he throws it up in the air and down the field. All right, now the down the field component of the motion is the horizontal arrow, and the up in the air component is the vertical arrow. It starts out with a lot of vertical velocity. You see that? The first blue arrow is kind of big. Now the second one is smaller. It's slowing down. All right, then it, then it gets to the top of its motion, and the arrows are now downward because it's heading back down towards the field where the wide receiver can grab it. And they get bigger and bigger. You know, so it's the same thing with a punt. You know, when, when the, the punt return man catches the ball, it's going the fast, as fast then as it was when it left the foot of the punter. Right? That's the absolute fastest it's, it's going to move at the beginning and at the end. Now, look at the horizontal arrows. You, just, you may as well just put ditto marks for all those. There's no such thing as horizontal gravity, so those don't change. The only thing that changes are the vertical arrows, and that's Galileo's idea of separating the motion, separating the equations of motion. It's a powerful co concept, and we use it all over physics. Now, I'm going to dismiss you, but... Uh, I want you to read into chapter three about the second and third laws of motion. Homework three, no, homework four. Homework three is running. Uh, it'll start at 1.20. It'll be due 12.01 on Thursday. You're dismissed.